Scrimmage. Three o'clock rock. I'm Jay Fidel here on Think Tech, and we're debuting a new show, a new, a new stream a series today um, called Changing the World for people who are interested in changing the world, like Sky Cohn. Welcome to the show, Sky. Thank you so much, Jay. He's a committed activist. We, we talked, what, about six months ago, maybe? And uh, wow, it was like um, it was like getting high and what and what Sky was saying. But it was also an entire universe. And I, and I walked I walked out of there thinking, that, well, Sky is Sky is the limit. That's what I said. Ooh, ooh. Okay. And today, today with uh, Sky Cohen, we're going to talk about what can we do about Donald Trump. It's a sort of an action question. But let's talk about first. Let's talk about Donald Trump. Um, what do you think happened? And what do you think of Donald Trump, Sky? Um, I think Donald Trump um, is an effective representation of where we are as a country, um, of 250 years at least of active colonization, um, of active imperial policy. Um, Donald Trump, in my perspective, was an effective reaction to the last eight years of Barack Obama, um, again, representing the high water mark of American liberalism. Um, and because when we look at Barack Obama, uh, Donald Trump's election, it wasn't just marginalized white folks in um, the Rust Belt, it was the entire white echelon. Um, the, all classes were represented. Um, and so I, the last thing that I want to feel is that Donald Trump is an external uh, imposition onto our country. We elected Donald Trump. This was a collective effort. Um, and the Democrats helped as well. The left helped as well. And this is part of an extensive um, neoliberal policy that lasted, uh, started at least 25, 30 years ago. So let me throw a soccer ball in there. Please. And, and that is, um, you know, what about what I call psychosociology, or maybe you could call it social psychology? Um, the fact is that if I feed a given population, a demographic, enough crap on the media, I can change the way they think. I mean, that's the way politics works. If I give you a million billion to do TV ads, I can win any, any candidate. Uh, isn't that kind of what happened here? Isn't that kind of what happened with Barack Obama? Um, and when we also look at the amount of um, amount of capital that Donald Trump spent on advertising, it paled in comparison to what Hillary spent. What and did what did Mr. Putin spend? Right. You know, I mean, but, but, everybody but, was but, spending. But, but, but I mean, even even that conversation over the past month again has been incredibly problematic because from the left it was this hope that there was more of an intervention from Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin didn't really have to do a lot. Um, it wasn't nearly the same sort of interventions that we've perpetuated in the global south. Like, again, Donald Trump is, um, is not Pinochet. He did not yeah, dispose okay. a democratically elected leader. Like yeah, it was we, it's waiting to happen. The people voted who voted for, for Donald Trump were waiting for Donald Trump to come around. And right. I agree with you. And he represents something that they were after, that they were waiting for. And, and he has arrived. And they voted for him because he is what they were waiting for. And it's really sad because what they were waiting for is not what you and I would have preferred. But what they're waiting for, again, is a cultural response. It's that if we're talking about um, the history of the United States, there's been only one black face as a representative. And um, over the past eight years, we've seen effigies burned, we've seen uh, images lynched. This has happened throughout the continental United States in response to Barack And we've Obama. seen a lot of racial strife, too, on top of that. Right, without a doubt. And that was also, again, I'm, I'm not defending Barack Obama whatsoever, but the response to that, I think, helps to inform where we are now with Donald Trump and where that comes from. Um, but also what's incredibly problematic is that Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, and Bernie Sanders all talked about reviving employment programs. When we know, especially folks who are um, part of the think tech extended community, that because of our relationship to technology and automation, these jobs are not going to come back. Yeah, coal is never coming back. Coal is not going to come back, and when or steel isn't going to come back either. Large-scale industrial manufacturing of automobiles isn't going to come back, and it doesn't make sense. And it's not something we should actively advocate for. We're in a unique position historically where we can get to a point where potentially we can be post-scarcity, where because of the rate of automation, because of um, our advancements in technology, in um, robotics, in nanotechnology, um, we should 
in theory, be able to get to a point where it is no longer viable. I mean, we are here now, where it is no longer to meet your subsistence needs through employment. This was obvious that, you know, the, the vast middle out there was, um, you know, waiting for Donald Trump, that the country has shifted, so to speak. Um, and, and so he, he wins uh, on the basis of an electorate, perhaps, that had not been, that had not coalesced so much before in the past. Why didn't we know it? Why didn't we see it? Why didn't the best journalistic and analytical minds in the country see what was coming down the pike? Why were we all fooled that way? Well, um, I think for the most part, there were a number of individuals who were talking about like the, the specter of Donald Trump, um, who have been talking about it for the past year, who have been taking his candidacy and his run seriously, mainly because the Democratic Party didn't seem like they were taking their position very seriously. And running Hillary Clinton after a very charismatic 40-something-year-old black man to run this grandma imperialist um, who is part of uh, the historical legacy of the, the empire of the United States, it, it, it didn't seem like the Democrats were taking it very seriously. So if they had taken it seriously, Sky, and if they had found somebody to continue the, and, and exceed the Obama initiative, you know, to, to, to take a natural, organic flow mm -hmm. post-Obama, what would that person have looked like? I'm not entirely sure that we, there's a condition that exists to cultivate that person. Um, I don't think the Democratic Party was interested in that. I don't think um, the electoral politics, I mean, the, what we've seen from the party leads us to believe that um, that was really their intention. Um, if, if we see the, the logical extension of the past eight years, we see an incredibly comfortable relationship with the fossil fuel industry. We see an incredibly uh, comfortable relationship with deportations, with increasing police budgets. And so I'm not entirely sure. Again, I think Hillary Clinton would have been a, a better um, a, a better individual to resist, uh, a more effective individual to resist than Donald Trump, because Donald Trump is incredibly confident with his policies. He's incredibly poli uh, confident with his picks. Um, there is a unanimous agreement in his regime and in his administration that climate change does not exist. Um, which is impressive, which is incredibly impressive that they would be able to find that many people who are in positions of power who all agree on this point. Yeah, and quite amazing, actually. It's, it's I mean, all the entire science, science community is to, to the contrary, and yet he persists and apparently will continue and appointing all these people who agree with him on it. Uh, you know, but you don't seem upset. You, you don't seem concerned. I mean, uh, uh, what's, your, what's your world view of this? Is this something we simply have to accept? Because, the, you know, he got elected, even though not by, by the popular vote. I mean, how do you feel about it, Sky? I mean, it's obviously something that um, I'm concerned with, something that um, looking forward into the future over the next four years, potentially over the next eight years, it puts ourselves in an incredibly precarious situation. But where we ended with the Barack Obama administration, still, again, if we had elected Hillary Clinton and we had a more centrist or liberal electorate, uh, we're, we're still on track to losing two-thirds of, uh, of the world's megafauna in the next 10 years. We're still on track to, um, again, with deportations, with income inequality. These, things, uh, the, these policies were solidified under Barack Obama. And so I wasn't particularly hopeful over the past eight years, especially when you come from a perspective of climate intervention. But you've been... You, you've been fighting for a more progressive, more liberal approach on things, and sure. you're putting in your, really, from our early discussion, your whole life on it, and being an activist in every way you could be, um, and, you know, now the worst possible candidate has been elected, what are you going to do, go to Canada? What, what are you going to do? Well, no. I mean, go to Canada and deal with Justin Trudeau. Like, uh, like Trudeau is doing um, a lot of the same things, except with the pretty boy liberal face. Um, in the United States, uh, in North Dakota, there was a temporary injunction in stopping the pipeline um, from the back in oil fields. And the response from Canada, because that's the largest supplier of petroleum in the United States, are the, the tar sands. They opened two large new uh, uh, pipelines. And that was all from Justin Trudeau's regime. He defended it. He said that he would use the state, um, that he would not tolerate any sort of misgivings from the left or from indigenous populations. And so, no. And we're ta if we're talking about collapse 
and we're talking about ecological collapse and a, a regime that the, the policy that they all agree on is ecocide, there's nowhere to run. Um, there's nowhere to run. You heard it here on Think Tech. I'm upset to hear you say that. Um, I, but I'm not. I'm not upset to think it, I'm not upset to feel it, um, because then we find ourselves in a situation where the conversation is now about immediacy. Um, because we're all impacted by climate change. If you have children, if you have grandchildren, yeah. if, if you interact with if we don't do all, something about it, we're all going to be, they are all going to be victims of it. But we were having this conversation four years ago. We were having this conversation eight years ago. It's worse now. It is, of course, because it compounds. Um, and so the question becomes, it's not how the periphery is going to act, but how is the center going to react? Mm -hmm. And so until we get to a point where comfortable Democrats, where uh, comfortable boomers are putting themselves in a situation where they're going to compromise their comfort against ecocide, against rampant development, then I think we're kind of in okay, a state of loss. Yes, we have to go there. We must go there. Ultimately, we'll, we'll suffer you know, huge damage to humanity if we don't go there. But when exactly are we going to go there? What are the conditions that will force us, may I say, force us to go? What has to happen? And Honestly, I thought that was Katrina. If you were asking for my honest opinion, I thought Katrina was the linchpin moment when we would have an honest conversation as a global community about the implications of climate change. Um, and then after that, it was when the president of Kiribati came forward and said they were planning to move the entire populace of Kiribati to Fiji. And that was another linchpin moment. Um, or the fact that during monsoon seasons, a third of Bangladesh is underwater. Maybe that would have been a linchpin moment. Um, and I think the serious conversation that we have to have, and especially in regards to Donald Trump, is the distinction between public capital and him as a representative of the federal government and him as a representative of private capital and how there's an active contention between the two. The federal government at this point exists to secure borders and to create a municipal infrastructure, which he's obviously not very interested in, and private capital is the market. It's about generating revenue. Um, and so I don't... Nobody is really focused on the big problem. I mean, it, it becomes difficult to, especially if as individuals we're working constantly to meet our subsistence needs, if we're having a hard time paying rent, if we're having a hard time sending our kids to school. All the disparities, all the sadness, all the homelessness, it's all there. Right. And, you know, let me suggest that I think what it inherently in what you're saying is that he's not going to address those things. He's not going to address those things, and we know he's not going to address those things. And actually, he's very honest about not addressing those things. Um, and, uh, but... What we should be, and I think is important to talk about, is again, that exacerbation of the income inequality. The answer isn't employment. And the answer at this point, and from this point on, will never be employment. So we have to have conversations potentially about universal basic incomes. We have to have conversations about interventions, but those are top-down interventions. It becomes very difficult to have conversations about universal basic income with people who are not engineers, with people who are not at the heart of Silicon Valley, who are not um, those who are in the process or in the position to produce abundance. Um, you know, there, there's actually universal basic income is happening. Uh, in, in Finland, in, I read. In parts of Scandinavia, and, and there are projects and, and, and in Ottawa as well. And there's a project um, coming on, on board in this country, too. I, I want to say California. But um, and in Oakland. Oakland, um, yeah. But again, it, it's not universal basic income. They're giving people $2,000 um, a month which is essentially paying for rent, almost paying for rent in yeah, Oakland. Yeah. Um, that's not what universal basic income is. Part of universal basic income is the ongoing guarantee that people will be able to meet their subsistence and beyond that be able to like choose how they interact with the world either as artists or scientists or philosophers. Okay, so you're, I guess you're treating Trump as a phenomenon, but the basic problems remain and the basic, mm, the basic mission of fixing them remains. And when we come back from this break, Sky, I want to know, um, you know whether your approach uh, about how to do that has changed because of his election and right now what you would do going forward after all we are here to quote may i say change the world that's why we're here and sky cone will be right back hey how you doing uh welcome to abachi talk my name is andrew lanning i'm your co-host 
And we have a nice program here every Friday at 1 o'clock on Think Tech Studios where we talk about technology and we have a little bit of fun with it. So join us if you can. Thanks. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Richard Emery. I'm the host of Condo Insider. You know, associations are really prominent here in the state of Hawaii. And they have a lot of complex issues with elected boards of directors, repairing and maintaining the building, how to make it quiet enjoyment to live there. So our show tackles the issues of living in an association by bringing in experts on various topics from owner's rights to association living to reserve studies to pipe repair to the new law regarding overtime. You will find it very useful in living in an association as well as if you serve on a board of directors of learning all the risks and rewards of living in an association. We hope you can join us every Thursday at 3 o'clock on Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you. Okay, it's just getting good with Sky Cone. Okay, so my question that I would put to you after the break is, so you had, you, you, you've been involved in a number of organizations, trying to change the world in every way you could, trying to reach out to these major issues of, of the survival of humanity, nothing small. Um, and, um, and Donald Trump gets elected. And my first reaction, which, which uh, I think you must agree with me at some level, is that he's not good for that. Right. <laughs> okay, the question then is whether your effort before has changed now uh, when I say effort, I mean your approach, your strategical approach to this. And what is your st strategical approach right now? We've got work to do. You have work to do. How are you going to do it? What are you going to do? Um, it, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. It can't happen in isolation. Um, and so the work that I do as an individual is secondary to the collective response that happens. And again, that conversation about the periphery and the center is that if we're constantly doing work in the periphery, people that don't care. And we've established that. History has established that. Um, I think what's happening with the indigenous populations in North Dakota is a perfect example because the only demographic that we care less about than black men are indigenous people. <laughs> and we watch black men being murdered on television for sport. That's what happens. And the only population that we disregard even more are indigenous populations. And so uh, while I do support what's happening in North Dakota and indigenous resistance around the world, it has to be more than that because that's been an active resistance for the past 500 years. So what do you do? Um, you must be getting impatient. I've be, we've been, I've been impatient. People that I surround myself with are impatient. And that's the conversation is about if there are people who are still comfortable, if there are people who are still stable, those are the people who are going to have to change. The people who are comfortably middle class or who find their situation slipping a little bit and so they entrench themselves even further until that sort of like uh, cultural lifestyleism is addressed, then there isn't going to be any sort of real political transition. So you're talking about complacency on a huge level. Right, right, um, especially in the global north, particularly in the global north. Um, and I think, and it's really unfortunate to, to say this, but I think one of the most successful or potential interventions is going to come from technological advancement. It's going to come because technology has rendered employment obsolete. It's because between Uber and their subsidiary auto, all large-scale trucking is no longer a viable employment option for middle-class, middle-aged white men who no longer can one-for-one one replace those jobs. Critical question. So what do you do with them? I mean, uh, and there'll be more of them all the time. What right. do you do with them? Um, and, and that's the conversation that the state has to have. We can't do, we can't do that as like I the left. I make you the state. Right, I make right, you right. the state. What, what do you do with it? Well, we don't deal with demographics in isolation. We don't say that like, oh, you just truckers or people who are working for McDonald's or who are per working for retail. We understand that employment is no longer effective means of meeting subsistence needs. And we accept that. We accept it and move forward and universal basic income would put us in a situation where we could get rid of um, the hyper bureaucratic welfare state where we're giving people out food stamps and then cutting them. The idea is making a political commitment that deals and is mirrored in subsistence. One of the interesting questions about the, the universal uh, basic uh, income thing is how will it affect the people who get the $2,000 a month or whatever it might be? Right. Uh, are they still going to be motivated? Are they still going to have a, a reason to live, uh, an identity, uh, a, a persona, if they don't have a job, per se? Of course. 
Um, and I think that's a really problematic characterization that is primarily... What he means is he doesn't agree with me. It's primarily <laughs> represented by boomers. Um, because for the most part, the boomers have uh, an entangled identity with employment. And it's very difficult to have conversations with boomers about uh, addressing and trying to explore individualized identity outside of employment. Um, but believe me when I say that as somebody who works with marginalized populations, with, work with homeless populations, with imprisoned populations, that people are interested, people are artists. If you give them an opportunity to go to school, to go to learn, to be productive members of society, people will do it. Nobody wants to just sit at home. It's actually very difficult to sit at home in a vacuum and stare at a wall. I'd be impressed if somebody was able to do that you, for 20 You agree with me, there are people who do that now. Which I think is fine. And I don't think that's necessarily a problem. That we should, th the idea is that if we give people the access to the agency, that the hope is that if along with the agency we're giving people access to education, we're giving people access to resources, that why wouldn't you become a scientist? Why wouldn't you become yeah. an artist? Yeah, yeah. Well, if, if, suppose you became a really successful scientist or artist. Would you be compensated for that, or you still get the basic living wage? The idea is that we move beyond the, I mean, yes. So initially is yes. There are still jobs. There are still people who are being employed. But the idea is people aren't working for subsistence. Their rent is covered. They don't have to worry about food. Everybody um, has a decent life. When, which is a pretty, it, it's unfortunate that's a revolutionary concept. Um, but it seems pretty straightforward at this point. You know, but it's not, not entirely revolutionary in the sense that technology in the past, what, couple, three generations has shown us that we can do extraordinary things without a lot of human toil. Without a doubt. And it's really incredible and that we can support ourselves as a population, even a growing population, even an enormous population through the leverage of technology. Mm -hmm. And so it is possible. It's become possible. Your argument about this today is much more probative than it might have been 20 years ago. Right. Um, so but how do we get there, though? Well, You're talking about upending the entire system well, here, Sky. Well, one of the biggest problems with this like, post-scarcity luxury communism is the market and how the market at this point is the purveyor for a lot of these technologies. And uh, two weeks ago, a week and a half ago, um, there was a meeting that Donald Trump had with the leaders of Silicon Valley. So from Tim Cook to uh, Bezos and Musk, and the entire infrastructure was represented. And for the past eight years, there was this wrong assumption that the left made that we assumed that Silicon Valley and technology was inherently ethically and morally on the side of the left. Um, yeah, I would have assumed that. W which was the wrong assumption that we made. Which side were they really on? W on the side of the market. That's which is, the side that they were Which is not the left. Which, it doesn't matter to them. And it would have been the side of the left if Hillary Clinton was elected president. Um, but again, when Donald Trump talks about creating a registry, when he talks about creating a wall, when he talks about any of these draconian policies, he needs Silicon Valley. When he's building a wall, there's, it's very unlikely that it's going to manifest itself in brick and mortar. And so if he's creating um, a situation where he, uh, the wall is mainly um, observed via technology, those are contracts that you put up not just to Boeing, but to Silicon Valley as well. Yeah, sure. Well, and Silicon Valley is actually making this happen as we speak. You know, all these gizmos that, that avoid human labor, it's really incredible. They're doing it for a buck, of course, right, right. but they're doing it, they're achieving it. And the question really is, um, the, the bottom line, how you get the money uh, for this um, what you call basic living right. uh, income um, from the government, presumably, right. um, to the people, to all the people. How do you, how do, you do that? I mean, you, you'd have to convince an awful lot of um, legislators and policy makers who are kind of in, in a way, they're in the pocket of the market, yeah. they're in the pocket of the, the capital concentrations. How are you going to change the way, how are you going to get them to do that? My answer is it's not going to happen. <laughs> like, I, <laughs> okay. the, right, I'm, I'm not a utopist and I'm definitely not a techno-utopist. Um, as a student of history, as a student um, who who's studied the market, I'm not really surprised uh, about Kakaako or like hyper gentrification that's happening in San Francisco or New York. Um, there are quite a number of people that I work with on the left who who don't believe that cities are for sale. I mean, and, and that becomes um, a, a point of contention is that 
I'm starting from a point in saying that the basic nature of the city, especially the ma American metropoli, is that of displacement and gentrification. It has nothing to do with housing. It has everything to do with generating well, revenue. Sure, sure. There's, there's a condo here for sale down on Kamakei Street for $100 million. Right. Um, and it looks down on the people below in the tents. Right. You know, so, you know, it's getting more impossible as we go. This gentrification is a right. kind word for it. It's, you know, it's huge le levels of disparity is what right. it is. So, but don't you think we have to fix that? Uh, without a doubt. Um, and I, like, obviously at this point, we realize that electoral politics are not an intervention. It does not work. And as we talked about before uh, with Electoral College, there were actually a number of Democratic representatives that changed their vote to Donald Trump when we all hoped it was the otherwise, that the Electoral College would have some sort of like conscious awakening and without a doubt, without a doubt. Um, and so if we're talking about intervention, that's off the table. Um, or else we're waiting another two years, four years, or whatever. And whenever we talk about the possibilities of like electoral politics, we're, we're talking about Tulsi Gabbard in Hawaii, and she's the best representation of of uh, like centrist state Hawaii state politics. She's not an interesting individual, and if that's the best Hawaii can do, then I don't think electoral politics is really the answer. Um, I think a lot of people agree with you. Right after this election. I mean, maybe they didn't think about it much before, but now electoral college, where do we get that from? And, and why is it different from the pop popular vote? And how come it came up with this outcome? So the question is, uh, who? that's a constitutional amendment. Um, that requires an awful lot of effort and um, you know, public agreement. Right. Uh, we don't have public agreement. Or, we, make or, it, or time. Or time, or time. Because it's all going to catch up with us. And it, it has caught up with us. And that's the... That's, that's my sense of immediacy, and that's, I've felt this sense of immediacy for the past eight years, for the past 12 years, and at this point it's sort of just waiting, and waiting for other people to also um, feel the same way. Um, again, if we're talking about not just Donald Trump as uh, a representation of where we are as like a global community, if I were to say that today um, in an unnamed country there was a representative government that went into a village and or a town and burned and murdered and raped individuals and refused to let them to, to leave um, that particular town, you don't know if I'm talking about Aleppo, you don't know if I'm talking about South Sudan, you don't know if I'm talking about Yemen, Gaza, if we're talking about uh, Kashmir, or if we're talking about the Philippines. And so we've entered into this new global paradigm where not only is um, climate change going to exacerbate these problems, because if we're talking about migration, there's, it's impossible to separate the two. You, 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 you know, you're a committed activist. Would you say that today, Sky, you are more committed and more an activist than you were five years ago? Without a doubt. Um, and would you say that the people around you, the people you talk to, the people who agree and engage in the conversation with you, uh, there are more of them? Would you say there are more of them in this country and maybe outside this country? Sure. Um, just in the same way that I would say that it's problem mainly because uh, the periphery has gotten larger, and so there are more people who are working poor um, that throughout the continent of the United States, but in Hawaii, when you read statistics of close to 60% of working adults are housing precarious, that's an in incredible problem that we know is only going to be exacerbated. So something has got to happen. Something's got something to. has got to give. And either we're going to be preemptive about what that something is, or it's... It will happen by itself. And, and it'll be incredibly disorganized, yeah. and it'll be easy to easy to reappropriate um, and so if we're having conversations I mean like Hawaii is a perfect example because it's this like self-contained little microcosm it's very difficult to generate revenue in Hawaii people stash their capital here as the Chinese housing market collapses in Beijing you have a lot of billionaires and millionaires coming which affects policy without a doubt without a doubt and is um, if we're talking about migration and the conversation about migrations are always about those who don't have access to capital. We don't want like migrant workers who don't have wealth, but it's never about folks who do. Things are going to change. It's, uh, the winds of change are here. And Sky Cone is a perfect example of somebody who's been following the winds of change, who is part of the winds of change, and who can tell us in the future, step by step, how the winds of change are going to change things. Thank you for coming down. but. You're not finished. We have to do this again and again, Sky. We definitely do, Jay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Aloha. Always. <laughs>